welcome you very warmly. Um, dear members of the Memory Studies Association, dear friends, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today, uh, Professor Olivet Otele. Uh, we were absolutely thrilled when Professor Otele agreed to speak at our planned conference in Charlottesville in 2020. Uh, and because that meeting was, of course, uh, going to be focused on memories of racism and raci racial injustice and violence and on the memory of enslavement in particular because of the location and because of the historical moment. Of course, that conference had to be canceled, as everybody knows. Um, but we believe that, if anything, Professor Otela's work as a historian, but also as someone who's deeply engaged in the public conversation and policymaking about public history and racism, has since become even more crucial. So we're very glad that she was able to join us virtually in Warsaw today. Um, I'm just going to make a few logistical notes before I introduce her properly. As you probably know by now, if you've been attending the conference, uh, we cannot see the audience, the two of us, so that's a little bit strange. Um, but you can put your questions and comments uh, in the chat wherever you're seeing this. And we should have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So you're welcome to start putting comments at any time and uh, we'll collect them and I will then read them out. And let me just take this opportunity to also thank our two technical moderators today, Angus and Sophia, who are going to be helping us. And, you know, all the technical um, people of this conference have been doing such a great job and we absolutely couldn't do it without them. So I'll now provide you with a bit more information uh, on Professor Otila's intellectual biography and her current activities before I hand um, the mic over to her. Olivette Otele is currently a professor of uh, slavery, the history of slavery and the memory of enslavement at the University of Bristol. And she was appointed to this post in January of 2020, which must not have been easy to start that job right before the pandemic started. Um, she holds a PhD from the University of Paris, La Sorbonne uh, in France. And her areas of research are colonial and post-colonial history and the histories and memories of people of African descent. She's a fellow and a vice president of the Royal Historical Society in the UK. And it's important to note that she's the first black woman in the UK to hold this post. And was also the first black woman to be appointed a professor of history in Bath in 2018. So that tells you a little something about the situation in the UK. Um, she's also the chair of Bristol's Commission on Race Equality, as well as a judge for the prestigious International Man Booker Prize. Professor Ortela has been the recipient of several national and international research grants, including from, for example, the UK's um, Arts and Humanities Research Council, the European Commission RISE, uh, Canadian SHRC uh, grant, and including most recently the UK Research and Innovation Grant, uh, which um, is for a project uh, about co-production of knowledge around the history and memory of slavery in Bristol. And that's entitled, We Are Bristol. Um, she's a regular contributor to the press, television and radio programs, including the BBC, Sky News, The Guardian, Sunday Times, Radio France International, uh, Elle Magazine, Vogue Italia, GQ, it's a very broad audience, uh, Huffington Post, New Yorker and more. She's, she's written extensively on the history and memory of European colonial enslavement and on minority ethnic communities in Europe. And her latest books include a volume co-edited with Luisa Gandolfo and Joaf Galay entitled Post-Conflict Memorialization, Missing Memorials, Absent Bodies that came out last uh, this year actually with Paul Grave McMillan. And she's also the author, and I see it behind her there, <laughs> of the highly acclaimed monograph African Europeans, an Untold History, which came out last year and which was shortlisted for the 2021 Orwell Prize for Political Writing. Um, Nicolas van der Waal, writing in Foreign Affairs, called this book a sweeping history extending from the classical world to the 20th century, in which she masterfully analyzes the changing relationship between Africa and Europe through the lives of individual Africans. And The Guardian wrote that the book's central message was what we see in the past as in the present is constantly in flux. It depends on our priorities and presumptions. 
as uh, Professor Otelo argues, providing multiple and more inclusive histories can empower people and can help discredit and dismantle racial injustice in the present. And so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Olivette um, and also give her the floor by turning off my camera. Over to you. Thank you ever so much, Jenny, and thank you members of the committee for inviting me. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I keep saying to my fellow historians that, uh, yes, I'm a historian and I'm a memory scholar, but uh, somehow this, uh, this message doesn't seem to be getting through. So I am in my element amongst you uh, today. So what I'm going to do is try and screen share while talking to you. Let me just see if I can do this. And where is it? From the beginning. Yeah. Okay. No, actually. Here we are. So, um, on the 25th of May 2020, many of us across the globe found ourselves at a loss, triggered, angry, sad, and many other emotions because of a video that showed the execution of a man of African descent, an African American named George Floyd. The event was followed by mass demonstrations across the globe against police brutality. Prior to that, of course, there was already a history of executions from Trayvon Martin, Sandra Brand, to many others before George Floyd. In Britain, about a tenth of identified deaths in police custody were people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. This is based on the figures from the charity Inquest which has identified 1,563 deaths in total during or following police contact in England and Wales since 1990. In France, I, could, I couldn't find the numbers, interestingly enough, but we have similar stories. And in recent years, we have had several cases and one of the most uh, um, uh, mediatized, if you would, was the case of Ad Adama, um, Adama Traoré, amongst many others. And this one was particularly aggravated by the bullying and the surveillance of the state against the family. The story is ongoing. So the question that mainstream media in the UK and France kept asking me, and in the US, of course, as well, uh, in some cases, so they kept asking me this question, in some cases with a, a slight touch of anxiety. These questions were are multiple, but the most recurrent one is, why did and does the US political and social movement encompassed by the Black Lives Matter resonated in so many countries? And how is this an American story that was by no means new and isolated, such as police brutality against people of African descent, is finding an echo in settings that were historically different? Of course, as a historian of European colonization, it seems obvious to me that the premises of the questions already reduce the conversation. The assumption that an American history of violence against people of African heritage had no connections with European countries' long history of oppression and institutional, institutionalized assault on black and brown bodies was quite interesting for me to observe. Firstly, because of the willful or unconscious misremembering of African of African American history of colonization, to put it lightly, because of the British input in the building of the United States, or to say it differently, because of the British colonist rather well documented role in shaping an Anglo-centric narrative of power in the 18th century. Journalists seem to be miss or disremembering understood as either remembering badly or as a failure to remember. It could be about unconscious acts in many cases, and those unconscious acts, amongst many other things, showed a failure of nations to teach certain aspects of that colonial story. Now, unconscious perhaps, but remember, because of a failure, but decisions were made, remember that decisions were made, and those decisions were by no means and conscious. And those decisions made were to remove histories of colonization and more specifically to remove those histories of violence and present them as stories of conquest, as stories of victory. 
And those decisions have, of course, been challenged for more than uh, 30 years, well, longer before that because of the decolonial movement or anti-colonial movement. But in the last 30 years, those stories have been really challenged at the core by the global South at intellectual level before reaching the global North. The construction of nationhood and the role of education in creating a carefully crafted public collective memory is also very well documented. And that crafted narrative of conquest has led, as we know, to a failure to remember, to misremember or disremember. The mechanisms of erasure were particular in France, where we know the role played by politicians and educators. And I'm thinking about 19th century educator Jules Ferry or historian Ernest Renan, who saw certain stories as irrelevant to the construction of national identity, or even prior to those people, the erasure of those enlightenment thinkers, such as Voltaire, Montesquieu, and others whose connections with slavery had been largely underreported for a very long time. And I talk about it in my article, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, debunking the myth of egalitarianism in French education, because these erasures and these processes have had an, a huge impact on the ways in which the history of colonization and enslavement has been taught in French schools. Despite dominant, curated, carefully curated narratives that, led, that have led to misremembering and disremembering, there were always what I called pockets of resistance against European colonial amnesia. Knowledge produced by those who found oppression existed on the outskirts of this discursive field of power. In fact, just as much as grand victorious narratives about European colonization were refined, taught to an elite, and then to the so-called masses, so were versions of colonial stories taught to the colonized populations that and those stories and those teachings coexisted with indigenous memories of oppression. So we have several layers, the elite, the masses, the colonized. And those memories transmitted from generation to generation were sometimes inscribed into people's body. And I think very, this is very important to me because the body tells, the body tells stories that are not sometimes found in, in books. I'm thinking about the ethnic diversity of various populations in the world and how they tell the stories of occupation, stories of rape and silencing. I'm thinking about my mother, born in Cameroon, the daughter of a woman who was the product herself of a history of sexual violence against indigenous women, and in this case, perpetrated by German colonists. She was born after the Second World War taught in schools about her blonde, blue-eyed French ancestors, the Gauls, nos ancêtres les Gaulois. Interestingly enough, she was never taught about the British occupation and the German ancestors, but rather taught about the civilizing mission of the French who got rid of the Germans and civilized the indigenous population and saved them basically from the British and the, and the Germans. So you have another layers of competing narratives between Europeans. Meanwhile, she could visibly see that her mother had been the product of a different kind of story. So parallel to those hegemonic European stories taught to children at home and abroad, there have been stories of resistance, resilience, and activism that are rarely taught. And when they are mentioned, they are often presented as histories of incidents, histories of riots, never as liberation stories. They are presented as minority stories. In fact, Black British history, what is known in, in the UK as Black British history, or Black history rather, was seen for a very long time as not being part of European history, not as British history even, but as a strand of history that collided with the main dish, the main story, Britain's history of empire. In fact, 21st century Britain is still struggling to even teach those so-called minority histories in schools. It is not only about the current right-wing conservative government. The widespread distrust and refusal to teach what is known as black history is widely shared amongst 
the, um, the political spectrum. We have, for example, former Labour Prime Minister Tony Blair's determination to embrace multiculturalism in the late 1990s. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, his education ministers who were focusing on the history of abolition of slavery and not a history of violence, not on the history of violence, but on stories of white saviorism, they were focusing on the role played by white abolitionists. We have another example. Former conservative prime minister David Cameron's support of what has been called the glorious island story, roughly 2013, 2014. And we have, well, the island story is about, let's focus on what Britain has done great and, and the greatness of, of the country and how that greatness was shared and illuminated the rest of the world, including Europe. And I'm not gonna talk about this in relationship between that discourse and how it went downhill with the Brexit uh, story. But it's quite an interesting one, as, as one could imagine. So we move on to the current Prime Minister Boris Johnson's ministers outrage at what they saw and they're still seeing as a dangerous revisionist move and how they actively right now working towards reinstating what they consider to be a glorious past of conquest and entrepreneurship of, um, of Britain, effectively displaying what Paul Gilroy called imperial nostalgia. That nostalgia has led to public attacks on those deemed dangerous to the current narratives. From culture minister threatening to remove funding from the heritage uh, uh, institutions to attacks on academics, me included, working on uncovering colonial histories, to the debate about statues in the public realm, and in particular, the recent frenzy over the toppling of slave traders statue Edward Colston, or even, even frenetic frenzy over the fear for Churchill's uh, statue. So you effectively see uh, Paulson being thrown into the river on the left and on the right, following a few days later, a few weeks later, I believe, you have the statue of, uh, um, of uh, Winston Churchill being protected by an impressive amount of police officers. The, the, the interesting story about, about this protection was that you had the far right, um, far right groups who came to protect the statue ended up fighting amongst themselves and attacking the said police uh, that you see. But anyway, that's a, another discussion. So now my long answer to journalists' questions about Black Lives Matter and the impact, and the, 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 the impact on Europe have been so far twofold. Black Lives Matter movement found an echo because it taps into structures movements and narratives that have been in place but ignored for centuries. The second point, in other words, the, the movement did not create new kind of grassroots organization, although it, it did to a certain extent, but actually tapped into what existed already. The second point related to the first answer is that history, of course, is not linear, but the present does not exist in a vacuum either. The refusal for full disclosure, meaning the refusal to include the history of violence against colonized population in school curricula had in the global north consequences. The birth of institutions such as La Police des Noirs in France, for example, which is a place for black people set up specifically, specifically for black people in 1776 also had consequences. The birth of police, police forces in Britain and in France was based on the need to protect those who were not deemed European against those who were on the margin, against those, the, the, the majority group. So those police forces were born from and in a racist environment in a racist context, 18th century, and their role were to protect those bodies. The problem is that they, they, there were little changes within the structure that put those in place. There was little changes and the fight was very long and very hard for some members of the minority ethnic groups to actually integrate the police force here. And I like this image that you see on the right because 
honestly, this is not a widespread image. You can see at least two brown people there featuring in the picture, protect Churchill. And I think that says a lot about the kind of narratives that um, is being transmitted or that the, you know, the current media and government wants people to, to see and to believe into, or to buy into. So long story short, the refusal to teach, for example, that history of violence means that the history of resistance to those violence was not taught either. In fact, liberation stories or resistance stories, when they are taught to play a specific role that both isolate them in particular contexts or erase the context that brought them. And I'm thinking about the history of abolition that focus on white saviorism and the few times that you would see people of African descent mentioned there, they mention as victimhood and they mention as those who collaborated to help um, the white saviors. The Haitian revolution, for example, one of the most important parts of the history of enlightenment, the history of France as a whole, but also the history of Britain because of the influence it had on colonial history, on British colonial history, is not taught in France, is not taught in the UK. The history of activism from students coming from Vietnam, Senegal, Algeria, and so on between the, the, the two world wars is not part of the French curriculum either. The contributions of Jamaicans, Trinidadians, um, and many others, soldiers from empire in European theaters of war, and how they also fought against discrimination from their own fellow white allies is not included in the English, Welsh, or Scottish curriculum. curricula. So how do we address these lacks, omission, processes of erasure? I realized that as a scholar, but also as a minority ethnic woman, as a black woman who was brought up in the global north, my role was to teach a colonial history that presented those nuances and that worked alongside various communities to examine who they have been able to produce, that what they have been able to, to produce, and actually to demonstrate that there is research done within those communities. They're not just there, you know, they have developed tools um, 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 to, to share that, those histories, and I'll come back to that. And they're not just there to, uh, uh, to serve as um, um, props for academic promotion, as is often the case. So the idea is to actually demonstrate that knowledge production from those communities is extraordinarily complex, and we can all benefit from learning about the tools they use to transmit it. Think about it. These stories have been supposed to be erased, and yet these stories have been transmitted from generation to generation. Now, I'm still the product of my own academic environment, and this is why I wanted to look at those stories of collaborations. And to do that, I wrote a book. And I, start, I, I wanted to start um, not with a slave trade, but with this idea of circulation of knowledge long before European colonization the rest of the world. That's why I start with the Roman Empire. That is the reason why, and the reason why I wanted to do that is that for me, it's a form of activism. And the scholarly production is also a form of activism. It's called scholarly activism, actually. But it's also about who gets to do that research and who gets to teach that history in the global north. So what I want to unpack here is that telling one story is an act of resistance. As a descendant of the colonized, I want to be able to teach those nuances. However, as we know, who gets to tell the story is rarely people who look like me. As Jenny was mentioning earlier, in 2018, I became the first woman, black woman um, uh, professor of history in the United Kingdom and the first person, the first woman, um, black woman to have a chair in history in the country. Think about it for a moment. The first one ever in the history of a nation. As brilliant as it might sound, it is actually heartbreaking. Out of more than 23,000 professors that the UK has, all discipline included, only 155 are black, 23,000, 
155 are black. And until 2016, there was only one male history professor in the whole of the country, Professor Aki Madi, no women. 2021, we are now four black professors of history, history in the country, yeah, hey. So I want you to think for a moment about what it tells you about the discipline of history and what it means for generations of activists, children, parents of, Af of African heritage, who because of the lack of representation in academia could not see themselves in those roles and in those spaces. Think about the ways in which nonetheless, these communities stories have managed to be told, taught, transmitted from generations to generations. Think about the sheer amount of work it took these communities to survive colonial amnesia so that I can sit here today before you telling you about those processes of erasure. Historian Ilan Gorzeev, in his volume entitled Destroying the Other's Collective Memory, um, made a plea for, let me see, examines the ways in which education was used to kill the so-called other's collective memory. He made a plea for what he saw as counter-education, as an answer to the oppressive function of certain kinds of national education and curricula. He notes, counter-education cannot justify or victimize one party or another. It is a transformative power that will allow both anti-human versions of ethnocentrism to be overcome. Counter-education deems it wrong to start the reflection from this or that historical point. The starting point, and I would defend that viewpoint because I agree with them. As a historian, we focus on the fact that the history is the be all end all, the start and the beginning and the end. As historians, we defend fiercely the discipline as being able to tell the truth the so-called truth, whatever that means. But historians have also been the guardians of, or the Cerber or Cerberus of, of the past. So what he said was counter-education deems it wrong, and that is the crucial part that I want to emphasize, deems it wrong to start the reflection from this or that historical point. The starting point is the question of life, and the meaning of suffering in relation to our responsibility for the other. It sounds simple, doesn't it? But it remains one of the hardest things to achieve. We haven't cracked that one yet as humans. That process is not only about education and knowledge. The process is about engaging with counter-education and counter-education is dynamic and take into account the question of physical violence, emotional assault, and socioeconomic imbalances. Counter discourses have been the bread and butter of marginalized and oppressed minority groups across the globe. People of African descent living in the global north have found ways to tell their stories in engaging ways, not necessarily through written archives that are and have been deemed essential, if not the most trusted source material for most historians of modern European empires, but they have been able to tell the stories through, for example, food, cloth, fabric, spices, the history of spices, ebony, through the histories of sports, through the histories of movement of black bodies across Europe. It is in these various elements of knowledge production and transmission that I see what I call guerrilla resilience. Again, I'm sending you back to my book, African Europeans, for more examples. Another element that is important when we consider the many ways of fighting against erasure, oppressive discourses and forms of resistance is language. Beside the, realms, the realm of dominance of many national education systems is the realm, and I say besides, meaning alongside, is the realm of counter-education I mentioned earlier, and one aspect of that question is the many roles played by language. Now, I know my Saussure, Deleuze, Derrida, and others, but that's not where I want to take this discussion. Language. 
Language is one of the tools used to promote integration. People born abroad and whose first language is not English are often accused of not wanting to integrate. When they don't do that, they can, they can, um, they're told that they, they must learn the language of the host country for practical reasons. But we also have heard people being racially abused because they allegedly didn't speak English or didn't speak, speak English properly or spoke English with an accent. Now, interestingly enough, the mastery of, European, of a European language was seen as a currency in colonial settings. In my book, African Europeans, I showed how elite children in Cameroon, where I was born, were sent to Germany to learn not just the language, but also maths, sciences, literature, and so on. And that was supposed to give them the tools to lead their fellow Cameroonians once they came back. Another example I took in the book is that, and I'm quoting here, prior to the arrival of the Germans in Cameroon, 1880s, the language used in the region had been local languages and English. These were taught in schools established by British Baptists and American Presbyterians. And as the German administration grew in strength, it forced the London Baptist missionaries to give up their missions to the Swiss German Basel mission in 1885. American Presbyterians had to use German as the main language in their schools. In 1887, Theodore Christella, a German officer in charge of education was sent to Cameroon. He soon set up the first German government school. Shortly after that, four, four more schools were established in the center, west and north of Cameroon. From 1897, German was the only language allowed in school. And by 1910, subsidies provided to school and churches and legislation had paid off. German had replaced English as the dominant language in institutional settings." End the quote. Another example I wanted to take that is closer to us. 2018, Sasha Javid, then Conservative Party Community Secretary, declared that 770,000 people living in England spoke, didn't speak English or hardly any. And in a personal interview, he described his own experience as a six-year-old interpreter for his Pakistani mother. He promised to expand teaching of the teaching of English for immigrants as he warned that up to 70% of those unable to speak the language were women, and most of them were from Pakistani or Bangladeshi communities. Now, what is interesting here is that language, oh yes, uh, he, he, he went further by explaining that because his mother was able to learn the language, to learn English, 15 years later after she arrived in the country, that completely transformed her life. She was able to um, delve, the family was able to uh, delve into clothing business to build new networks of friends. And later on, his mother was able to freely uh, um, uh, talk with his wife, Laura, and, their, and her grandchildren. So language is according to the minister, a source of integration. But what about those for various reasons can't learn the language? Language then becomes a tool used for discrimination and in abusive homes, the tool for oppression and power acquisition. So there's no intersectionality and in thinking really through about what it means to discriminate against people who do not speak the language. The second point I want to make is, how does the transmission of specific language work? Well, we have seen that language is a way to acquire and exert power. Language helps shape individual experiences and collective memory as well as counter memories. So acquiring power through the mastery of language, and in the case of uh, 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 Sajid Javid, mother, completely transformed her life. So counter memory in that sense is also about discourse, right? It's also about a practice that goes against established norms and accepted norms. So counter memory through language, if we expand beyond what Foucault said, is not just about power and domination resistance. It's also about the multiple interaction between official discourses, official education, counter education, and um, the counter to the counter education. And I'll come back to that um, a bit later. So bearing in mind that in that official narrative, as far as history is concerned, actually, there's constantly a dispute among scholar about the formation and creation of knowledge. 
And what I mean by that is that historians, as you certainly saw, have been debating among themselves and against each other on nearly all aspects, thus changing the so-called official narratives or the, 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 you know, the, the official discourse. I guess, so what I'm saying is that even the official narratives are challenged within their own sphere of official narratives. So even the official narrative have, it have their own counter narratives within. Speaking of knowledge production, erasure, absences, the time has come for me to tell you more about our edited volume. Yeah. Why? Because it is about ways to tell stories that are both central to national discourses and central to those on the margins or so-called on the margins. It is about forms of activism, erasure and resilience. Our volume has 12 contributors and saying their names is my own way of thanking their outstanding work, the, the, the huge con contribution to, to the authors. It's also my way of remembering, telling one story I told you from earlier on, telling people's name when you pay homage to them is incredibly important for me. The volume is also about remembering in the absence of bodies and how we inscribe stories into the global narrative related to mourning processes. Rather than explaining what it is about, I thought I'd just um, use um, the synopsis that we wrote. So as the world negotiates immense loss in questions of how to memorialize, the contributions in this volume evaluate the role of culture as a means to promote reconciliation either between formerly warring parties, perpetrators and survivors, governments and communities or within the self. Post-conflict memorialization, missing memorial, memorials, absent bodies, reflects on a distinct aspect of mourning work, the possibility to, to move towards recovery while in a period of grief, waiting, silence or erasure. Drawing on ethnographic data in archival material, from, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, sorry, Argentina, Palestine, Israel, Wales, Peru, Colombia, Hungary, Chile, Pakistan, and India. The authors analyzed how memorialization and commemoration is practiced by communities who have experienced trauma and violence, while in the absence of memorials, mutual acknowledge, acknowledgement in the bodies of the missing. And the fabulous authors are, Joanna Manogren Selimovic, Andrea Ziplau, Riza Gandolfo, Mansa Pajek, Whitney, Kelsey Yutney, Eva Williams, Williams, Sandra Rios Oyola, Alexandra Kowalski, Yoav Gali, Ben Yuda Omri, and myself. And seriously, I'm inviting you to read the volume. The chapters are excellent, even if I do say so myself. So my chapter in the volume is entitled Mourning in Reluctant Sight of Memory from Afrophobia to Cultural Productivity. And it is about the way the representation of the colonial past can be oppressive for young generations of, lear generations of learners. On my, and, it's be, and I drew it from my personal experience. Let me tell you a bit more about it. In 2016, my family and I visited Penryn Castle. Yeah. Located near the city of Bangui, North Wales. The city, the, the visit began with a treasure hunt for the youngest child, amicable and professional, the castle um, employee sent us off to discover what the intriguing place had to offer. Silently, silently proceeding through various rooms, we quickly noticed the reverence and admiration from the group that preceded us, the grandeur, of the place was not lost on us either, despite a sense of an ease. Prior knowledge about Penryn's connection with the slave trade could lead the visitor to expect, if not a homage, a plaque of some sort, at least a mention of those who unwillingly contributed to the castle's wealth through their work as captives in the West Indies centuries before. No black visitors were to be found in the place. Friendly but unsettled gazes followed us at times by a series and those gazes were followed at times by a series of questions from a few visitors 
about which island I was coming from. And those questions led me to believe that my children and I were those missing visit, black visitors. We were there to perform blackness in this suddenly ambiguous setting where history, heritage, and legacies of colonization were colliding. Similar interactions continued at various stages during the visit. They seemed to result in the same way of friendly bond and a relief from inquiring visitors. I was not from an island, and one of my children had a Welsh accent while the other had English received pronunciation. They were born, both born in the UK, and in Wales in particular. So we had shown our credentials, it appeared. We were an Afro-Euro-Welsh family. This allowed the conversation to turn to and solicited discussions about identity in a few instances. We were also attributing me new meanings to the place through a common kinesthetic experience. So for me, the, the work on the body is incredibly important. Drawing Alexander R. Lurie's approach to body memory, we were both as a family, as visitors, re-encoding pain and sensations, adhering to or creating new signifiers and enduring pain. Enduring opens the door to a world of inner dialogues. Enduring is the bread and butter of resilience as well. Enduring is also the cause of trauma, intergenerational trauma that, are, that is not voiced and shared. And while that was happening, one could not help but be struck by the physicality of the various families' narratives presented in the rooms. There were stories about people long gone, more specifically was a story about a family right to prominence through colonization, the Pennant's family. The enslaved population had paid a heavy price for these beautiful objects to exist in the castle. Death impregnated, impregnated the place and yet no mention was made to the black dead bodies. Why am I telling you this? Two things, telling one story, I told you, is about power and reclaiming one's place in absence. Telling one's story is about what is known as ego histoire or ego history, to effectively inscribe one's story into the regional narrative and therefore into the story and trouble the, the, the kind of narrative that is being presented. That was the aim of my writing this chapter. It is about power, of course, and ways to counter absences by writing one's story. So it is also about what I call black narrative pedagogy and counter memory. It is about how the outcome of those stories are not always happy and the ways in which erasure can sometimes take over. Nonetheless, what is seemingly forgotten on the one hand can prompt communities to remember. And this is what the rest of the chapter is about. In Wales, the Black Lives Matter movement actually in 2020 ignited a debate about the devolved region known as Wales. For those who are not familiar with, with it, with the region, it's on the west side of England on the map of Britain. Devolved region means that Wales decides on its own school curriculum on, his, on health and, and many other issues or questions. And myself and other academics in Wales were tasked by the first minister of Wales to, um, to, to, to conduct an audit about memorials associated with slavery. Another task group's role was to work on a new curriculum that would integrate the stories of people of African descent into the Welsh curriculum. And this is major, major piece of work and piece of information because England is still struggling to accept that. And in fact, the government has indicated that integrating those stories and stories of uh, black history into the curriculum won't happen. So the Black Lives Matter movement led to the rewriting of regional stories in place that had a very, have a very small black population. In fact, 0.6% of the population in Wales is of African heritage. They're known as Black Welsh. The reasons are both for, for this, uh, um, to pursue that avenue for Wales. The reasons are political, social, but also historical. For a very long time, for centuries in fact, Wales had been subjugated to England, and even the Welsh language was suppressed and people forbidden to speak it. So it is also about counteracting the discourse, the English dominance uh, uh, um, discursive field. Just, but one thing is interesting though, is that just like Scotland and England, Wales 
was also involved in colonial violence and in the enslavement of people of African descent. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's messy, multi-layered, if you would. What is interesting in relation to, to this is that it's the question of absence and the question of count memory and the rewriting of official narratives. So in Wales, we have an official narrative that is being rewritten by the officials at the pressure and under the pressure of minority ethnic groups, under the pressure of white liberals as well. And that is fascinating to observe. Still, as far as counter memory in practice is concerned with regards to Wales, we have an art center, Bristol Art Center, that existed, that was set up by communities and that was completely decimated because it did not receive funding from the Welsh government. So stories and counter narratives and, and discourses created by communities have been let, let down while, while the official, um, the central power was creating its own counter narrative. I just want you to invite to read that chapter, but I also want you to consider the question that I'm tackling in that chapter, which is Afrophobia or Afrophobia. Afrophobia. What is currently, and that Afrophobia is currently being debated within the European Commission in various offices. At the heart of this discussion about Wales and slavery is the question of hypervisibility and yet invisibility of people of African descent. So what is Afrophobia? The term refers to a series of negative behaviors and the starting point to investigate how these attitudes influence the way knowledge and memory are produced and consumed in 21st century memory in 21st century Britain. So these art attitude goes from an ease in the, in, the, in the presence of people racialized as black to avert and covert act of discrimination against these populations. The subjugation at the heart of the social and cultural development of, institution, of an institution known as the Brantocracy in the 18th century has led to all these legacies of the past discrimination and so on and so forth. So absence, mourning in the past, rewriting the present and past are key elements that have shaped the collective memory, um, uh, Britain's collective um, colonial memory. Any counter discourse to an official representation is very difficult to study when those boundaries are blurred in certain instances. So for me, this is really about fighting meta pedagogy or meta um, um, or, or dominant narratives and hegemonic discourses, which means a dominant way to teach, a dominant way to learn. So Ego Histoire, for me, allows me to delve into community stories of resilience, liberation. So let's move on a, a, a bit more. What I want to really look further is the desire. So everything seems clear cut. You have the communities, you have the officials, officials um, transforming what the communities is doing. But what is interesting though, is that the community does not completely exist on the margin as one would think, because there is a desire for acceptance of many marginalized communities and stories that cannot be ignored. So, um, Feminist Audrey Lord argued that you cannot dismantle the master's house by using the master's tool. I'm not sure I completely agree with that. Let me be clearer, marginalized community stories and people often long to be recognized, not completely, but some of them long to be recognized and accepted by the majority group. And that works both ways, by the way, the majority group won't some marginalized communities to create their own stories so that they can take those stories and integrate them into the, the bigger narrative. And that is about questions related to social cohesion. So how really counter, how really revolutionary are those narratives? How really revolutionary are the tools used to dismantle the master's house and oppression? Well, I have no answer, no, no uh, form answer to this. I've been thinking about this and I've been thinking about the construction and the fight towards uh, um, racial equality uh, against racial injustice. And at this age, my answer really is that there is no one answer, no unique solution. Let's take, for example, a fight against 
hegemonic memories through the recent toppling of statues. I'm thinking of course about the city I'm very familiar with, Bristol. So the city of Bristol toppled the statue of a slave trader and that set up a whole things in motion across the country and the globe. But what is often not said is that actually Bristol had reached an impasse. This discussion has been ongoing for decades. In fact, I did my PhD on Bristol, slave history, memory, uh, uh, and politics. So um, defended in 2005. Years later, we're still going on. So what happened is that the toppling crystallized a moment of unity, an expression of public solidarity, but an expression of public solidarity that was carried out by activists, minority ethnic groups, artists, but also wealthy upper-class students who were not originally from Bristol. So the toppling, the toppling crystallized a moment of, of um, a moment of solidarity, but that moment of solidarity is also contested by those who were bred and born in Bristol. So because they resented and they still resent the external interference and the interpretation people are making and the use and the political use of the, that toppling and how he had ramification uh, within the country. And one of the ramifications is the interpretation from the Home Office, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, and the fear that she expressed of widespread toppling movement. And, and, and the fear was justified in a way because people start considering other statues as well. What is interesting is that the counter discourse to that toppling is a group that is working that is called Let's Save Our Statues. So there's a counter narrative to that counter official narrative. Again, in Bristol actually, people focus on statue, but, I, but what I also wanted to, to say is that the statue is only a small part of actually what has been happening in Bristol. Um, I, I, I wrote about guerrilla art in Bristol and I couldn't show you images. I had about 20 images of um, kind of punctual anti-monuments that appear and disappear in Bristol that, um, that counteract or counter, um, that are actually at odds with the official narrative about one statue. So in other words, the focalization of one statue is incredibly um, reductive compared to what is ap actually happening on the ground. Graffiti artists, it's a, you know, the city here, um, graffiti artist Banksy is only one example. I mean, the city is known for graffiti art on street art. The city is known for temporary monuments and that has been the case for, for, for decades. So I would invite people to, to dig a bit deeper and perhaps stop focalizing, um, focusing on, on, on only on uh, Colston. So it becomes very difficult then to identify which movement is really counter narrative. So I don't know how much we're doing in terms of time. Uh, let me see. Okay. I think we're still good. Um, we're good. <laughs> we're still good, yeah. Okay, but I have a, a, a long conclusion though. <laughs> I want to conclude and add another element to the debate that is about convergent activism, which is, and convergent activism is all these movements coming and crystallizing and working together. And I want to end with our volume again, Missing Memorials, and what can be said about activism, memories, and new ways of understanding activism, because it really worked differently, differently depending on the settings. But more than that, I want to show you an example of convergence when it comes to activism, and that example is taken again from, from the UK and it's taken from, um, from Bristol. A month ago, we were successful in a grant application that looks at the histories and I insist history is plural uh, of Bristol. The project will last two years and the project has four strands. So it's about knowledge production, uh, knowledge production from citizen, what is known as citizen scientists. The idea is that various communities have been producing knowledge without the means to share it at city level, city, citywide level. So it is about working with those citizen, citizens to construct 
a multifaceted narrative uh, or multifaceted narratives uh, that give so that we can have a fuller picture of the histories of the city while providing the opportunity to engage in several ego histoire and to engage in activism, forms of activism, to engage in artistic production. So the four strand, just to explain a bit more. So you have strand one led by Richard Stone and the strand one will investigate the lives of Bristol slave owners and those who claimed ownership. Using the records of compensation awarded when slavery was abolished in 1834, the team of citizen researchers will identify Bristol slave owners and find out how their money has been has shaped Bristol's built environments, businesses, and charities. The researchers will also use the Caribbean slave registers to investigate the lives of those who, whose forced labor generated this wealth. This is a story that is known, but there's always more to be learned as we found our more archive, archives are shared. Our people are coming forth and forward with new material. And those people are citizen scientists, they're the citizens of Bristol. Strand two, will be led by, um, is led by my colleague, Jessica Moody. And it's about working, and she will be working with uh, creative partners, Cleo Lake, who's also the former Lord Mayor of Bristol, and Quasi Johnson, an artist in collaboration with citizens, in collaboration with, with artists, dance groups, to identify sites of memory in Bristol's cityscape. In the project, this strand will explore these sites and their connections to the histories, of, histories and legacies of transatlantic enslavement by foregrounding the knowledge and experiences of Bristolians and by using creative led practice approaches and by uh, developing um, augmented reality and augmented reality app. A third project, Bridging Histories, will create a global learning resource for communities exploring issues of contested heritage. And the project is learned by Dr. Joanna Birch Brown, who's currently the co chair of the Bristol History Commission. And this project, this particular strand will take learners on a journey through exploring street, street level histories, family stories, sharing recipes, poems, being monument detective. And they'll finish up by becoming um, change makers, doing something simple to make a positive change in themselves and their community. So there's an intergenerational thing going on as well. And finally, the last strand led by Marianne Gournet will partner with the Global Majority Teacher Network and Bristol City Council Education and Skills Directorate to examine how inequalities and racism experienced by people of color in the education sector are inextricably linked to slavery and legacy and its legacy. The City Council is also very much involved in this and so are various grassroots organization, um, individuals, and definitely all citizen scientists. So we are, so it, 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 it's research, activism, public engagement, but it's not coming from the top, it's not coming from the bottom, it's us trying to meet people in the middle to create a new kind of narrative. So we are exploring new ways to do history, new ways to tell marginalized, but also widespread stories to create narratives of inclusion through this new research. Now, um, this, <laughs> we started a month ago, when you work with people, you have to be able to understand the, 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 the anger, the passion, the expectations and all, and to take it in, to accept that it's part of, the, part, of the, part of the journey. So it doesn't go and it won't go without difficulties. So please do wish us good luck. Thank you. Well, absolutely good luck, <laughs> Olivette, and thank you so much. Uh, for this fantastic lecture um, and you know the final project that you shared is so interesting in terms of its methodology as well but there's so much rich material material that um, you shared with us in terms of you know the importance of uh, paying attention to the absences and the erasures in memory about the body um, of bringing oneself into one's research um, of doing uh, memory studies in, in that way right of naming names and practicing counter um, memories um, as scholars as well. Um, paying attention to the nuances of activism. You just talked about that in, in Bristol. And one thing that I think is especially important for us as an association, since we're relatively new, and when you know we don't have departments for the most part yet, 
but what you said at the beginning about uh, the structural racism that's embedded in the different disciplines that we all come from, um, I think is so important for us to, to think about as we institutionalize more now, uh, if we manage to do that. So there's so much, um, I, I, I don't want to take up time because I know people are eager to ask questions. So I'll um, go to the chat um, and read out the first question here from um, Zhuja Millet. And it's um, to do with your concept of counter-education. So she asked us long, get ready. <laughs> I would like to ask for a clarification when you suggest counter-education when you suggest counter-education, do you propose multiple histories or one grand narrative with a starting point on life and the meaning of suffering? If the latter, how do you think that all perspectives can be inclusive of this type of history writing? Is this type of reconciliation of history a possible way to the elimination of epistemic violence as well and will not again silence unintentionally other possible views? So okay, that's the whole uh, question. Thank you. I'll try and, and um, break it down so that um, to explain how I understood it. So the idea of counter education is quite an interesting one because we assume that there's one education that is the, about the grand narratives, and that has been the case for in, in many places in many ways. We always have various counter counter uh, narratives and counter education across the spectrum and wherever in our lives. But when you look at the curriculum, what is taught in school, there is one narrative that can have deviations and nuances, but actually it's a set, um, a set number of information that is transmitted to children. And in, in Britain, there's in many places as well, there's very little leeway to deviate from that narrative, which means that actually there is such a thing as a hegemonic discourse and that is not necessarily as oppressive as it used to be a century ago, but that is still very much embedded into the way um, the nation sees itself and wants to project itself. So it's part of the grand narrative in a way with its small nuances. So what I'm proposing and what I'm arguing is that there are, people can take it in. Children and young people can learn more about certain kind of histories, traumatic histories without having to actually have these set parameters. We can open up as educators. I was a primary school children, a secondary school children, and I'm a university teacher. So I know exactly how these levels work and what students can take in and can't take in. The assumption is that, oh no, that we can't teach them a history of violence, but actually you can. And there are ways to teach that, not through blood, tears and all that, although you can. The ways is teaching the interaction and how it, the interaction was forced. And this is what I'm arguing. And it's, the, and it's for me, one of the many important ways to, um, to end uh, amnesia, although that's a big question, to kind of tackle amnesia rather, but also achieve a form of social justice. For me, it's a respect that is paid to those who are not mentioned in those narratives that is incredibly important. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> well, maybe um, because the next question is also about counter-education. So um, this one is from Aniston Pennington. Um, and she says, uh, you mentioned alternative mediums for storytelling, food, fabric, movement, etc. Have you found that any particular works and alternative mediums have influenced your scholarly practice, not simply serving as source materials, but as models for scholarship itself. Thank you for this fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, I, I experienced with various uh, teaching tools, obviously with COVID, we had to experience with anything to do with virtual. Even virtual exhibitions are quite interesting. Uh, what I experienced is not, for example, not necessarily, of course, not necessarily in a classroom, not necessarily in a field trip, but also finding ways how you do, you learn by practicing. In other words, students are let on the field, are let in, well, let. They are engaged in community activism. They engage in community construction of identity. And from then they can pick up what they deemed relevant and, 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 and follow a tram and follow um, a timeline and what they deem important in understanding these communities. I don't come and tell them these two communities has done this and that. 
they go there and find out what matters to these communities. And of course, with the, uh, the uh, you know, with the agreement of said communities. And by doing that, they construct their own material and understanding of the world. And when we go back to the classroom, then we have the official books, we have the official records, we have, because I'm working on enslavement, we have lug books, we have uh, mass, um, uh, merchant uh, uh, narratives that are in such a stark contrast with what they learn, with what oral history has taught them through these communities. And through those tools and through those various means, this is how I tell them that there are other ways to do history. And I'm hoping that they engage in more. And there are other ways, you know, just the food testing is, is just, is, it seems fun, but it's actually, it can lead to, um, to fascinating ways to learn about the trajectory of plants and animals, for example. Thank you. Um, there's a comment here from Cheryl Cheffin, and she just says, I appreciate the layers of community engagement. That's all she wanted to say. Um, the next question <clears throat> is from Irina Pert. Um, she says, thank you for your presentation. Have you encountered problems or criticism with your approach to research as activism or research activism? Okay, I invite you to Google my name. <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, the criticism, um, you know, in academia, the criticism, it, it's, it's constant and, and that's fine because, you know, this is where we're, being, we're challenging each other. The criticism outside academia from far right groups is immense. The criticism from grassroots organization who are a black grassroots organization who consider that um, um, the master's tool is also there, you know, and I accept all these um, viewpoints. When I say it doesn't go without pain, it comes, the pain with it is there, but I accept these viewpoints because we are in, in the 21st century and I never thought for a second when I was a child that I'll be in a position where these ideas are confronted and we can talk about these things openly and challenge each other. So yeah, yeah, I have encountered criticism. <laughs> So um, Aniston Pennington, she just wanted, she said, thank you. That's a very interesting pedagogical model. And um, Jill Strauss um, would like you to talk a little bit more about augmented reality in your new project. Okay, so it's about creating an app. So that was born out of the fact that we can't go out. I don't know if you, oh, I've forgotten his name. A few years back, there was an artist who created, um, he used the statue of Edward Coulson, I can't Google otherwise, I, who used the statue of Edward Coulson and he covered, just Google it, Edward Coulson covered in gold. And he used augmented reality to actually say that this is a man who was, who made his money through the enslavement of millions of people. And this is what it looks like. He was covered in blink. And I think this is one, one of the, the aspects that um, the, the artists want to explore what are the layers of stories? What is not said in here? Just that beautiful statue of a man thinking and standing there doesn't actually tell you where the money's coming from. So how do you tell those stories through, um, through memorials, really? Um, Using technology, the... sorry. <laughs> Um, just another comment from Ute Hildekorn, who's one of my local colleagues here. She says, this has been an incredibly inspiring talk. So very grateful for highlighting so many complexities within colonial history in today's British society. Yeah, very much. And then Cheryl Chaffin um, uh, has a question for you, which is a big one, I think. Uh, do you, will you or do you want to write an academic memoir? Oh, my word. Um, it's funny you should say that because actually my family says I should and they say I should because as a black person a lot's going on as a woman a lot is going on and it's on a weekly basis so it's the level of the level of the layers and level of ordinary violence is almost fascinating when you step back because it's like a movie. So they say, perhaps I should write it while it's happening, otherwise I'll forget, but yeah, it would be interesting. 
I would probably need to change a few names though. <laughs> Well, we, we talked yesterday, if I may just inter uh, interject this, um, we had a round table on doing memory studies differently. And one of the things we talked a lot about is how we can bring ourselves and what we experience and the, the trauma, you know, uh, uh, sometimes of what we study, but also what we experience ourselves into how we do memory studies. So um, that sounds like a good idea to me. Also as a model for, for others, right? Um, but let me read the next question. Monica Jermok um, asks, could you say a bit more about what you mean by street level histories? Okay, street level histories is uh, citizens from all backgrounds coming and telling their own stories, but also engaging with the story of their neighborhood. Um, for example, you have inner cities in Bristol. One of them is, is St. Paul, and St. Paul is one of the, um, the poorest uh, neighborhood. So, and St. Paul's is not very far from Clifton where the university is on top of the hill. So these stories and these communities have a very different experience from the others, but also there are layers because a lot of them are minority ethnic groups. So there's a story of the legacy of enslavement, the story of uh, social exclusion and poverty. And there's also the fact that geographically, there's a, a trek to go to, to, to see the, the, the rich, if you would. So they have different layers of, of street stories to tell. That's that's what I mean. Um, the next question comes from Doron Eldar, and um, they say, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. We see now projects by artists from countries formerly colonized by European nations, erecting monuments, memorials, and European cities. This work not only challenges amnesia, but also places the history from the ex-colony as belonging in European national history and therefore Europeans with roots in these ex-colonies as belonging to European history and nation. How do you conceptualize the role of ex-colony diaspora like artists in negotiating not only accountability but also belonging to the imperial European state? Okay, that's a very good question because I didn't mention the fact that this seems to be a European story where the dia you know, people of African descent born in the country. But there's constant movement, there's black bodies in movement, and those, uh, you know, those, the, those former colonized bring in new ways of looking at that history that has been taught. And I think the dialogue cannot really happen without them. And in fact, um, I, I showed the, the, the book about unsettling uh, Western education, and some of the uh, contributors are talking about this, I'm thinking, and I've removed that from my presentation because it was going to be too long. I talked about uh, Dr. Sabello Nvolu, who has been, uh, among many others, um, from, from uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, who have been, uh, among many, has been among many others, to push the decolonizing movement. So we, we, everything about here is decolonizing the curriculum, the museum, but actually the move came from the global south. So this is not happening without them. Is just acknowledging their contribution and their push there. Same for the question of repressions, by the way. The next question comes from a Canadian colleague, Matt James, um, and he says, thanks Dr. Ortelia for your wonderful talk. I'm thinking about your illuminating remarks about convergent activism, which as you observed, I think involves in many locales, counter memory activism, toppling statues, telling counter stories, but also on the other hand, dominant groups mobilizing to save our statues, silence and threaten dissenting voices, using state coercion to enforce triumphant curricula of empire and so on. Could you say more, if you please, about the opportunities and perils of this remarkably clarifying an intensely polarizing moment of global reckoning. Thank you so very much. Okay, because you're talking about, uh, because you're talking from Canada, in fact, I was involved some years ago in a five-year project called the Promised Land Project. You can Google it. And the Promised Land Project was about the history of um, Black Canadians in Southern Ontario and how actually that history and those histories need to, needed to be included into the, 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 the national uh, curriculum and how this push came from community activism um, despite the counter narratives, despite the far right uh, uh, intimidation, despite all sorts of things. And it 
it really it made sense because of the convergence, the, the various work done by scholars, of course, but also activists from across the whole of Canada and across the border as well, uh, on the other side, uh, the, the, the Canadian American border. So I strongly believe in, <laughs> it's, it's crazy how I believe in this, I believe in collaborative work and I believe in the power of togetherness because this is the only way that we can move out of that hole of erasure and, and colonial and uh, violence and, and legacies. So it's finding those um, like-minded people and working with them and constructing things with them. It can take years sometimes, but it's incredibly important and it's the only way. And it's not just about, I talk about black history, but the indigenous population, we, we, we build bridges and we do collaboration, collaborative work as well. And in fact, I'd be in Canada if COVID allows it to continue that, that work uh, in a few months. Um, there's another comment here from Alan Martell. Um, and he says, your street level histories reminds him of Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States. Um, there's a question from uh, someone from the uh, co-presidency actually, which is something that we've been struggling with as, as an association. And I experienced this today. I attended one of our panels on histories of um, racial violence and enslavement. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but everyone who presented on the panel was white. And I think if I looked correctly, everyone in the audience was white. And I think this reflects something that, um, you know, we as an association have apparently not been able to attract, um, you know, a, a cross section of memory scholars. We have not been attractive for some reason. Um, or, you know, our networks are Eurocentric, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder whether you have some insight into, um, well, obviously you, you've already said that, you know, there aren't a lot of, um, black scholars who are in your position, but um, there are, of course, people rising up um, through PhDs and so on um, in the new generation. So, you know, is there something that we can do to um, recruit those uh, scholars and, and, you know, um, attract them to our events and make them yes. part of our community? Yes, there are things to do. I'm not saying this is the, the ultimate solution, but for communities that have been um, undermined, discriminated against, there's the economic aspect of it. And the economic aspect is the, uh, the opportunity to, for example, not having to pay for those. I don't know, I didn't look at all, I should have, but for, um, um, what is it called? The fees, uh, the um, registration fees are a problem. As a, as a student, I struggled with this. I had to track grants all over the place. Um, but I'm not, it's not just because, because of, because I'm black, it's because I was a student, a uh, postdoc and all the rest of it. And there's also the fear because it seems to me, and I don't want to, you know, to, to, to be harsh or, or anything, but I'm also blunt. It seems to me that the perception is that it's going to be about um, European history uniquely and Eastern European history uniquely or a certain aspect of the reputation is certain aspect of the Holocaust. Now, my background is that I'm drawing almost a lot, at least of my uh, theoretical base on Holocaust studies. So I actually like that. But there are other stories and other theoretical bases, as I mentioned, uh, Sabello and, and others uh, in, in the state in South America, um, who are doing extraordinary work. And I think it's a question of just reaching out to them. Sometimes they don't know exactly what's happening, but the fear of being marginalized within that is there. But reaching out, I can guarantee you, you'll have people. I can guarantee you. Thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely important to point out that, you know, it's not just about uh, uh, racial or whatever you want to call them divides, um, but also economic ones. And um, we have tried to address this, but I do think that we have a lot of uh, um, work to do in the association and, and as a field to, um, you know, uh, 
think differently about memory theory and to read other stories and other theories and other concepts, which is something that the round table last night about bridging across different languages tried to address. And it's obviously, um, you know, a challenge, but also something we want to tackle. Um, okay, next question. Um, a comment from Hannah Teichler, who's uh, our interim co-president, and she says, yes, especially given the fact that there are more and more papers, publications, and networks which deal with the legacy of slavery, et cetera, uh, yet we do not seem to be able to reach this community. So yeah, just to confirm what I've also um, seen. Another question here from Uti Tofon Inyang, um, relating to your point about alternative, sto alternative storytelling, do you also see a similar impulse in the diasporic art produced by people of African descent that insists on multivocality? I'm thinking about the incorporation of pre-colonial writing like the uh, Nisbidi scripts of from Southern Cameroon and really excuse my uh, pronunciation into artistic production by European US based artists. How would these artistic forms relate to the idea of street level histories? Okay, first of all, I was born in Cameroon and in the southern part of Cameroon. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in um, you know, knowing more about this. The collaborations are there. Um, the collaborations, as I mentioned, are important. And we go back to this idea of it, it kind of breaking that hegemonic discourse, even in art and even in collaboration, there's the economic financial element who gets to have the money to actually work with, with artists. Um, I've seen that it's possible. I have seen another project that we have with the European Commission where the European Commission funded our project on the basis that it recognized that there were powerful, powerful knowledge and expertise that was in the global south. And because of economic reasons, that knowledge was not widely shared. So I think that it's also uh, um, our, our role as members of, of uh, the diaspora to, to work towards this kind of collaborative uh, work, um, to encourage this collaborative work. And actually I've seen a lot being done, not just through grants, a lot is being done uh, uh, online. A lot is being done with exchanges, uh, between exchange of artists and academics and so on and so forth. So I would like to actually continue that, that the possibility of that discussion about multiple collaborative uh, work that did not put a burden on the global south to not only educate only but also the financial burden i don't I haven't got a solution but i think it's it's a way forward well um we're basically out of time so let me just note that we've had over 170 um uh, attendees via Drifter and more on YouTube and Facebook. So I think in the era of Zoom fatigue, when, you know, there's so many competing, um, uh, you know, offerings online for, um, and everybody's sick of it. Um, I think that is an amazing statement about, um, you know, how interested people are in what you had to say. Um, so let me, on behalf of the Memory Studies Association and my fellow co-presidents, uh, just thank you again for this fascinating lecture and for being here today. And I hope that next time we meet, it's actually in person, <laughs> either in Bristol or in Nottingham or in Seoul, which is where our next conference is, uh, or somewhere else. Um, and with that, I want to wish everyone um, a, a very nice evening or day or night or wherever you are. <laughs> and thank just you. ask uh, Olivet if you have any last words you want to share. Um, so that I don't take the last word. I just wanted to thank everyone. This is a huge privilege for me to, to have a chance to, to engage with you. And I thank you for the questions. I hope I answer them um, you know, to the best of my abilities, but I am an incredibly hopeful person. I think we can do this and we're working towards engaging in various dialogues and we keep doing that. And in a way, Zoom has actually helped many people um, do that. So um, yeah, thank you.
Well, thank you again. And uh, let me just note that this um, session is going to be available via YouTube um, to the public. And so, you know, people will be able to engage with it even, even after. So that's uh, great. So thanks again and uh, take care. Take care.